It's been less than two months since news of the coronavirus broke, though to some it may feel like years. As the media bombards us with daily updates, we'd like to pause and reflect. Today we bring you a special report on the timeline of the coronavirus outbreak in China. When could the alarm have been pulled to alert the public and halt the outbreak? And why, under China's political system, a cover-up is almost guaranteed and is likely to happen again? Welcome to China In Focus. I'm your host, Tiffany Meyer. January 20th is possibly the most important date on the timeline of China's coronavirus outbreak. Before that day, people in Wuhan were carefree and unconcerned about the virus, thanks to reassuring announcements from authorities. They weren't wearing masks. They were visiting infected hospitals, which don't separate fever patients. They were even enjoying massive banquets, where over 40,000 people shared meals together. But after that day, a Chinese expert appeared on state media to confirm that the virus is actually contagious. That's when the country started to panic. Authorities began taking drastic measures, but still wouldn't stop the flood of tragic incidents from happening. While you are probably being bombarded with scary new updates every day, NTD would now like to help explain the incidents leading up to January 20th and discuss questions like why this public health event is not an accident accident for China, why the disastrous outbreak and its cover-up are almost certain to happen under the country's communist system, and finally, when could China's authorities have pulled the alarm, enacted preventative measures, and avoided the loss of lives? The earliest sign probably showed up in mid-November. This is the voice of a physician in a Wuhan clinic. In an interview with NTD on January 22nd, Dr. Wei said his clinic has been experiencing a surge of fever patients since last November. A research paper published later may have affirmed what he said. Commenting on the paper by The Lancet, infectious disease expert Daniel Lucy told Science magazine that if the new data are accurate, the first human infections must have occurred in November 2019, if not earlier. Fast forward to late December. Information about a mysterious pneumonia outbreak is already circulating inside China's hospitals. Doctors are warning families and friends to stay away from a place called Huinan Seafood Market and be careful of a potentially SARS-like virus. That includes Dr. Li Wenliang, who posted the lab test results of the coronavirus patient in a group chat, writing, please tell your families to take preventative measures. In later interviews, some doctors also revealed that healthcare workers were starting to become infected around this time, a sign that the virus could spread between humans. This should have alerted health experts. Health officials in Wuhan were indeed alerted, but instead of ramping up safety measures and alerting the public, on December 30th, they issued a document forbidding all medical institutes or individuals from disclosing any information regarding the new disease. At midnight on the same day, Dr. Li Wenliang was summoned by the police. They questioned him about why he was spreading so-called rumors online. A few days later, Dr. Li was asked to sign a document reading, We want you to cooperate with the police and listen to our reminder and stop the illegal act. Can you do that? Li wrote, I can. On December 31st, Wuhan's Health Commission finally posted an announcement about the outbreak on their website. They confirmed 27 new cases of the infection and said there was no evidence that the disease was contagious among humans. But according to a research paper written by Chinese officials, which was published later, the number of virus cases had reached at least 105 by the end of 2019. At that point, 15 people had already died. A media report also shows that one major hospital in Wuhan, Xihe Hospital, was forced to transform an entire floor of the facility into a quarantine space for contagious disease. Not knowing about the potential danger, Wuhan locals were still visiting the potential origin of the virus. One Chinese reporter saw the seafood market operating as usual as of December 31st. None of the people the reporter talked with knew anything about the viral pneumonia. 
Still, nobody was wearing masks. Compared with carefree residents in Wuhan, those with better sources of information started taking a completely different kind of attitude. According to an internal document, a military-affiliated college in Wuhan started a de facto lockdown on January 2nd. The document requires a strict check for anyone entering the campus. Visitors have to go through fever checking, and people are forbidden to enter the campus if their body temperatures are over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. On January 4th, the Hong Kong government activated a serious response level in reaction to the outbreak. This was nearly 20 days before Wuhan City's lockdown. On January 6th, the Center for Disease Control in Shanghai acquired the complete gene sequencing of the new virus. They found over 89 percent similarity between the new virus and the deadly SARS virus that caused the pandemic in 2003. The information was sent to China's national CDC in an internal document. The center recommended that authorities implement preventative measures in all public places. Then comes an extremely quiet period for the coronavirus. From January 6 to the 17th, Wuhan authorities reported almost zero new cases. The lull reassured Chinese people. The mysterious pneumonia didn't appear to be a contagious disease. But there might be another reason behind the quiet. This 11-day period was when authorities in Wuhan City and Hubei province held their most important annual political meetings. Over 2,000 representatives of the people gathered to discuss the amazing achievements of 2019 and how 2020 will be a tremendous and promising year. As to the virus, it was barely mentioned. In an interview with Hong Kong Media Initium, professor of sociology at Stanford University, Zhou Zhuguang, said that he was not surprised by the Wuhan regime's response. He explained that downplaying negative incidents, especially during major political events, is the Chinese regime's coping mechanism. He said only that the consequence of following their playbook was so disastrous this time, and that is something the officials didn't expect. Meanwhile, the reality is getting worse. According to an SOS post on Chinese social media Weibo, the person's dad was confirmed to have the viral pneumonia, but the Xihe Hospital in Wuhan refused to admit her dad due to a shortage of hospital beds. Another netizen posted that his entire family was infected. They went to the Tongji Hospital in Wuhan and saw that there were so many patients that some had to lie on the floor of the corridor. His father was also sent home to self-quarantine because there weren't enough hospital beds. The post was later deleted. So were all other posts in the user's account. That's the week Wuhan authorities didn't report a single confirmed or suspected case. Everything seemed to be under control. On January 17th, Wuhan's Tourism Bureau even issued over 200,000 free tourism tickets. It was an effort to entice people to visit the city so they can experience the Chinese style and warm sentiments of Wuhan. Not only was the Chinese regime cracking down on the negative rumors, they were also working hard to prevent information from making its way out of mainland China. On January 14th, a group of Hong Kong journalists accompanied Hong Kong experts who were invited to conduct research on the virus outbreak. The reporters were later detained by Chinese police who photographed their reporter IDs and asked them to delete all footage taken inside hospitals. From January 12th to 16th, over 3 million passengers left Wuhan by train to visit other cities in China. On January 18th, Baobu Ting, a populous district in Wuhan, held an annual banquet to celebrate the Lunar New Year holiday. But three days before, staff from the neighborhood committee, who were concerned about the outbreak, asked if they could cancel the banquet. But district officials denied the request. Over 40,000 families eventually joined the banquet. If you're a resident of Wuhan and you've been following the government's directive not to believe or spread conspiracy theories, here's what you'll know about the coronavirus. First, there is zero infection among medical staff. Second, there is no evidence that the disease is contagious. And third, the outbreak is preventable and controllable. But on January 20th, for the first time ever, a Chinese expert said there is actually human-to-human transmission of the virus. The number of infected people exploded. Three days later, the entire city of Wuhan is put under lockdown. Over 50 million people were impacted. 
A political analyst says the Chinese regime takes advantage of free speech in the West to push its propaganda. This in the wake of the State Department unmasking Chinese operatives working as journalists in the U.S. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more. The State Department last Tuesday designating five Chinese state-run media outlets, including China Daily and Xinhua News, as foreign missions because they're owned or controlled by the Chinese regime. The U.S. government will require these news outlets to give information on their real estate and employees to operate in the United States. The State Department says these agencies are not independent journalistic outlets, but are part of the Chinese regime's propaganda machine. A senior political analyst on China says the Chinese regime has been spreading its propaganda in the U.S. for many years. It's not a represent. It is foreign government. I think this is a very accurate to describe those entities, those media. Actually, in China, there's no regular media. It's not the media in our mind, what media is supposed to be. Inside the party, there is a department designated to control all the media. It's called the Department of Propaganda. Of course, they changed the name. Um, they changed the name called Department of Publicity. Department of Propaganda is exactly word by word translated from Chinese. Recent years, you know, some uh, uh, communism or some kind of uh, like socialism is getting coming back uh, not really coming back it's never popular in this country y you can say this is a conflict between two totally different system uh, you can say this is an extension of the cold war because the cold war is based on the different ideology not the other you know conflict the basic conflict of the uh, cold war is ideology and uh, when Soviet Union collapsed, the Chinese regime took over their leadership, Soviet Union's leadership. Uh, they used the opportunity of this Western society's uh, freedom of speech, freedom of media, to promote their agenda, their propaganda. Um, in U.S., U.S. governments are not allowed to make any, uh, to create any media. U.S. government has only two media, one is the Voice of America, another is uh, uh, Radio Free Asia, but they all broadcast overseas. They cannot uh, put in this uh, country. Uh, why U.S. government has a restriction, while foreign government, uh, of course it's a uh, foreign government hostile to U U.S., uh, United States government, U United States values, and uh, why they can do whatever they want to do in this country. This is not about uh, freedom of express or freedom of media. It's about uh, uh, the infiltration of the foreign power with totally different ideology, totally different value, and uh, not only export uh, the human rights violation, uh, it's all exports their values and they will have a strong impact, influence on our society, on our values. So I think this is important. Uh, when you read this and you don't realize this is a f foreign propaganda and not regular foreign propaganda, it's a totally against U.S. values. And uh, if it's labeled, then I think it should help the ordinary Americans to realize um, what should be trusted, what should not be trusted, or at least you have some question mark put over, the, uh, over there, you know, when I accept this news or so-called news, I need to uh, um, be really be careful. Here at China In Focus, we bring you first-hand information from inside China. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates.